So as you may know, as a loyal fan of this Bowls.tv live stream and the ensuing Human Meme podcast, I have been studying Italian to become more fluent, so I may be a more effective promoter of the ASL Opera Project, which is something that Jana Marie and I are working on hard every day to bring opera to deaf audiences. A whole new world, a whole new set of people to bring into the opera house because they have been excluded and ignored. And when you are excluded and ignored, your sense is, I don't even want to be a part of your thing anyway. So that's an issue that we're dealing with to make it culturally, thematically acceptable for the deaf to attend an opera. And as part of my opera training, my Italian training, I watch a lot of Italian television. I wrote a review of Cyborg TV. And the other day, they had a documentary on Italian television in Italian. And usually I watch just to immerse myself in the language. But this particular documentary was about the Living Theater, the theater group, started by Julian Beck and Judith Molina. And Julian was long gone, dead, and Judith was giving an interview for this documentary in English. And then the documentary people did a voiceover translating her into Italian. But if you listened carefully, you could sort of hear, you know, Judith speaking English under the Italian voiceover translating her over her. <laughs> so it's really fascinating. And they were showing clips of performances by the Living Theater, which was a theater group in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and maybe sometimes 80s, that strove to make changes in American theater. And they were sort of inspired by our toad and theater of cruelty. Judith talked about that in the documentary. But it was really fascinating to see these old films in black and white, I don't know who made them, of some of these living theater productions. And it's 60s and 70s, there's a lot of naked bodies on stage, a lot of strange, you know, revolution. And I thought it was so curious to see that something like that, a documentary really like that, would appear today on Italian television? Would a documentary like that appear today on modern American television with those clips of the struggling bodies? I say probably not. Because nobody's really interested in that anymore. And I was taken back to my graduate days at Columbia University in the city of New York with the great Howard Stein talked about the living theater and its history and its importance. And he knew Judith Molina, and she came and spoke to our class one day, and she was just a wonderful, lovely, terrific person. And it makes you wonder, you know, what if you wanted to try to keep the living theater going today? And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. But let's say you wanted to have a theater that dealt with political issues of the time that was sort of radical. Now, the 1960s was a very dramatic time, especially in the Americas. 67, 68, 69 was a big turning point year. And the sexual revolution. And I remember Howard Stein telling us in the 1960s, when he was at Yale, the battle cry from the students in going against the system of repression was kill your parents. Not kill society, not kill the president, not kill the administration of the university, no. Kill your parents. And he said it was kind of a tenuous time to be a parent because you had these radical 
children of the 60s out to cleanse the world so it's a better place. And to do that, I guess their idea was that they had to kill their parents. That was the rallying cry. Nobody really did it. Okay. And then you think about <coughs> the now, the 2020s. So we're talking, what, 40, 50, 60 years ago. A couple, three generations of change. And the rallying cry of young people today is not kill your parents. It's I'm not leaving the house and my parents are my best friends. Now that's a massive change in theology of the mind and theogony of the body. We've gone from I'm leaving home at 18, I'm striking out in the world, kill your parents, to I'm never leaving my mother. My father and I are bonded forever. I'm living in the basement until I die. Some of that is economic change, but the philosophical change of not wanting to strike out in the world on your own is something that's very interesting. Because in America, you're always taught to be self-sufficient. You get up, you take care of yourself, you go into the world, you make your own way, you don't rely on others, goodwill, you make your own goodwill, that's the idea. And that's gone today. Now young people want to attach to other people. They want to make other people responsible for their behaviors, their attitudes, and their feelings. And the most insulting thing you can say to a young person today is, I don't control your feelings. I don't make you feel a certain way. You are in control of your feelings. You make yourself feel a certain way. Not other people, not me, other people, you. You decide how you feel. You decide what you're going to do. You decide if your feelings are hurt or not. Not other people. There's an old saying, oh, people never forget the way you made them feel. And I've always said, I don't make anybody feel any way. People feel their own way in their own way. It's their life. So I got to thinking about the living theater and what the living theater meant then and if it means anything now. So here's a little bit of background for you that I've done a little research for. So this is Judith Molina, <clears throat> very lovely. And uh, you know, after her husband Julian Beck died and she was kind of on her own and she then she got another husband and I guess the relationship with Julian Beck was sort of open both ways for both of them. It's not infidelity, I guess, if nobody cares. And so after he died, she kind of, I guess, had to keep the living theater going pretty much on her own. So she did a lot of mainstream acting, which was a good thing because she's a very talented actress. She was in the Adams Family as, I think, I don't know, Thing, Ant Thing. I don't know what it is, but she was in that movie. So Judith Molina, just for a little bit of a history lesson, German-born American actress, director, writer, with her husband Julian Beck, they co-founded The Living Theater, a radical political theater troupe that rose to prominence in New York City and Paris in the 1950s and 60s. The Living Theater and its founders were the subject of the 1983 documentary, Signals Through the Flames. Now, that's probably what I saw. The 83 documentary from, how many years ago is that? And it was really great. <laughs> but the interesting thing about the movie, the documentary, <coughs> is that the whole idea of the theater is that you go and you share the moment with other people in the audience, and then it's gone forever. The theater is not a television show. The theater is not a movie. The theater is live and changing every moment and no two performances are exactly the same, even though you rehearse it the same way every time. That's the beauty of the theater, of the live stage, of the live opera performance. So the fact that the living theater, who's all about being in the moment, allowed, wanted to have their performances preserved on film tells you a very interesting thing about the art. 
People want to survive. People want to be remembered. People want to be propagated. People want credit for what they did. So this is an early picture of Judith. And she had this career. Here's a rehearsal. It's Judith of the Living Theater. In 1983, okay? So this is about the time that the documentary was made. And I was in New York in uh, 1988. So this is Judith in her old age. They had two children. Here's her filmography, Bachelor Party, Flaming Creatures. She, she did a lot of movies. Dog Day Afternoon, 75, very famous movie. She was in Radio Days, Adam's Family, very big, right? And so Judith Malina was a wonderful, uh, kind person. And her husband, oh, here is her uh, obituary, dead at 88. This is a very famous, this, 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 I don't remember the name of it, the prisoner, I think. This onstage cage prison was in the documentary that I saw that was in Italian. So they keep restaging their old work, which is what you're supposed to do, because you have a body of work that you want to keep sharing. So this is uh, Judith in 2007, looks fantastic. And how she died, what her life was like, I'll put all of these links on our Discord server. Love the old pictures. Miss Melina Wright in Arachnia in the mid 90s, right? So she was very alive, very interesting, a 60s free spirit. And it was really an honor to say hello and to get to know her. So Julian Beck, dead at 60, founded the Living Theater. Now, Julian Beck is a very interesting person. Now, you've probably seen him uh, if you saw the movie Poltergeist. He's the old man outside the window or the door or whatever it is, talking about death and something's coming. He kind of always looked like a skeleton. That was his thing, right? Not that there's anything wrong with that. Terrifying. The Living Theater, which Mr. Beck founded in 1947 with his wife, Judith Molina, was one of the most influential and long-lasting companies of the avant-garde movement. Its work, especially The Connection, The Brig, Antigone, brought social issues and audience involvement to the fore. Audiences at a living theater performance could expect to be exhorted as much as being entertained. I think if we look at this world as it really is, Mr. Beck wrote in 1965, we will find that even what is most ugly has within it the sparks of life. And I think we go to the theater to glimpse those sparks. That's why we get so excited before we go to the theater. It's because we're looking for light in a very dark world. So they had a vision. They had meaning. They had purpose in their life. This is Julian Beck in the Cotton Club. This is Julian Beck and Poltergeist. Scary, right? Scary looking guy. And he liked it. He wanted to be a scary looking guy. That was his thing. And then you wonder what gets left behind. Two superstar parents. And you do a little looking, and you find the son. This is Garrick Beck, son of offstage son, they call him, of Julian Beck and Judith Molina. As the son of Julian Beck and Judith Molina, the Living Theater founders, I was raised in the vibrant and expansive off-Broadway theater world of the 1950s. 
And then his biography goes on to indicate his life, really, that was intertwined and pressed into the living theater. And he goes talking about himself, then talking to his parents, but not his parents saying mom and dad, but saying <laughs> Julian and Judith gave over one of the studio rooms in their 14th Street Theater to start up peacenik groups and other civil rights activities. I worked there in the afternoon after school learning how to do mailings, paintings, postings, phone trees, and other social organization. So this child of these two theatrical innovators was put to work in the family business, I guess. In the fall of 1967, I entered Reed College in Portland, Oregon, where I studied humanities with friends from the Portland Peace Movement. The Back to the Land movement and the psychedelic arts, health, and yoga communities, we produced the Vortex Festival in the fall of 1970, a free celebration of music and camping that drew 5,000 people. In 1983, when the Living Theater returned to New York, I assisted the company and my parents with technical archival and printing work. We retrieved Julian's caches of paintings, drawings, set, and costume designs from the numerous friends we had and relatives, where he had left them before leaving the States with the theater two decades earlier. I worked with salvaging these as well as assisting with literary press and other theater affairs. And they left because I guess Julian and Judith owed the IRS something like $23,000 in unreported income. And they defended themselves in court and they lost and they were put out on bail because they weren't really seen as a threat. And I guess they up and ran away to Paris and stayed there for about 20 years. So this is the offspring of Judith and Julian, one of them. And this is his life that he shares in an autobiography. Now, it's interesting what people decide to share when they talk about themselves. And people who tend to talk about other people and other influences when it's your own biography is a, a very interesting case study in how people think and feel and are formed. And Garrick Beck, having two radical, if not interesting, and historic parents, is sort of caught, trapped in that bubble of their fame and influence. And it's not just him, Sean Lennon, Julian Lennon, John Lennon's sons, same sort of bubble, Danny Harrison, George Harrison's son, from the Beatles in a bubble. In a way, it's sad and lonesome. You may have a trust fund. You may have names, infamous names, from which you cannot escape. And the old saying, Henrik Ibsen wrote about it quite a lot. August Strindberg, quite a lot. Sins of the fathers are visited upon the sons. And if we want to extend the thought, the sins of the father and the mother are extended and visited upon the kids. And you begin to wonder how people are trapped in not who they are or what they want to be, but what their parents are and how their parents chose to defend and define themselves. It's a bit of a harbinger. You wonder, how do these children survive? Can they go their own way? Can they pop that bubble and do something else and find their own way in the world? Sometimes it's better just leave home at 18, disconnect everything, strike out nameless, humorless, backgroundless, and just see what path the world leads you to take. It's dangerous, but that's the way it used to be. Today, you just sort of stay in your bubble, play video games, be online, 
and stay best friends with your parents.